everyone and welcome to our Friday Curriculum Planning for Chromebooks Hangout with some of our uh, Google Chromebook schools. Um, happy Friday to everyone and thank you for joining. We're going to have uh, a few housekeeping things I wanted to talk about before we get started. And uh, first, just as a tip, um, you can, uh, we're going to, we'd love for you all to submit your questions and comments, and you can do that within Google Plus in the comments area directly below the video. Um, as a tip, one thing we like to do is if you're watching the video in your browser, you can open up another browser window um, and go to the Google and Education page, and that'll allow you to keep the video going in one, in one browser and in another one um, where you can post your actual questions and comments. You will have to refresh the page to see the comments and, and possibly answers that someone from our team might be posting up there for you. Um, and what we're going to do today, first of all, my name is Mike Schwab from the Google and Education Chromebooks team. I'm joined with Tom Gerke. Hi, everyone. And we're going to be moderating this today. And we have an exciting lineup today. We're going to have Andy Schlupp, and I'm sorry, I know I just messed that up, from Vail Unified in Arizona is going to talk to us about um, their plans of using an open uh, web-based curriculum and how they're using Chromebooks in the classrooms right now. And then we're going to uh, be joined by Vidya uh, Nagarajan, and I know I butchered that as well, who's our Chrome product manager, um, who's going to give us some great updates on the Chrome Web Store as well as app packs. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Andy. Thanks, guys, just for giving us a chance to share a little bit about what we're doing. Um, my name is Andy Kloop, and I work in the Vail School District outside of Tucson, Arizona. Um, this is our first year using Chromebooks in the past. Um, hey, just Chrome Andy, real quick. Yeah. Can you, um, it, your volume's pretty low if you want to speak oh. up a little bit. Or it, okay. Turn it up. Let me adjust the setting real quick. There we go. <laughs> Can you guys hear me any better now, or is it still pretty bad? Yeah, we can. That's better. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Might have just been a little plug ahead in there. Anyway, so I'm out here on the east side of uh, Tucson, Arizona. Um, we still are primarily a Mac district, but we've got two specific programs um, that we've started experimenting with Chromebooks quite a bit. Um, one is a blended <laughs> program um, where we've got students working you know, part of their day in a totally online um, environment, online coursework, and then the other group is a uh, sort of CTE high school um, where they're using the Chromebooks to, um, is sort of like their main uh, device. So, I don't know, can you guys see that screen at all? Yep, we can, thank you. All right, cool. So, I mean, I guess just part of our, our planning process, I was just sharing this with um, Tom not too long ago, is that we talk a lot about um, like this idea that um, with all the devices, you have like a certain amount of capability, or I mean capacity in any device you use, and then you kind of have the uh, capability of folks to actually use it. And so when we went round and round as we were making up you know, our decision, what is going to be the best fit for our curriculum and moving forward, we kept coming back to the same idea that oftentimes we buy this device that had this ridiculous amount of capa uh, sort of capacity to do things, and then consistently... Um, in an evaluation process, we would find that the capability of the staff and the students to use those devices didn't meet up with what was possible. So um, that was one of the first steps that we did is we kind of started focusing on, so what are the things that we can actually do to start moving the needle forward as opposed to just constantly like buying the greatest, latest whiz-bang uh, gadget um, and think that that was going to change our classrooms, whether that was a document camera, a smart board, one-to-one -one across the district, those types of things. So the first thing that we did um, actually was a little more teacher-based, and I'm going to just kind of show you that. I think you guys can see my screen. I'm just, I don't know how long the delay is. There you go. Um, as a district, we actually came together and did some curriculum planning um, that we've been doing for multiple years, but sort of the all of it coming together was this thing that we call Beyond Textbooks. And what that was was that as we started realizing that we really wanted to move to a one-to-one -one environment with a heavy emphasis on digital delivery, we knew that we had to start creating a platform that, that teachers could actually use to, to share. Um, so what Beyond Textbooks is, um, some of it's, it's all tied back to like our curriculum calendars and, and mapping. 
but it's basically a repository um, where teachers can go because this right now is primarily a teacher tool um, to get digital content that they might share with their students. So some of the things that that might include is that all of our different district documents, um, curriculum documents are in here. Um, so for example, like our unwrapped documents, this helps teachers when they're sort of planning out their teaching. Um, but then more importantly, some of our things like our formative assessments. And even though these right now are just PDFs, what this is doing um, is it's allowing folks to take these tools and start using them in like quiz builders and other things that they're using as they push these out to our students. But kind of the more important part, like this really was just the digital curriculum binder, right? We had moved from, from like a paper-based system to a digital-based system. When we did that, we also said, you know, if we're going to have all these teachers coming to this site, why don't we start allowing teachers to submit resources as well? Now, this site is used by teachers that are both in one-to-one -one schools and our digital learning environments. But what's kind of cool is that we're starting to see tons of our teachers use this repository of resources as a building block for sort of their online content delivery. Um, so they may um, take different things from these teacher submitted resources. You can see that like, you know, some of these are just good old fashioned worksheets, which of course are, are not the most exciting thing in the world, but somebody may grab one of these and modify it into a digital quiz. Um, they may go in here and grab some presentations. These are presentations that people have already pulled together and they may either zip those up and ship them off to a student so they can view them on their own time um, or they may use that as the basis of a podcast they're eventually going to do. Um, teachers are also just sharing different ideas and of course one of the ones that gets used more than anything um, I think is just some of the various websites and basically free, some of these are free, some of these are open educational resources that people are finding all along, um, all around the web to actually, you know, pull in and use in their classrooms. And then so for us, sort of the next logical step in that um, oops, was for us to um, start pulling that into to Moodle, which I'm sure many of you um, may be familiar with. Um, oops, you know, I had our class all set up here and my uh, web browser crashed a second ago. But at this stage of the process, um, our teachers are kind of in like that transitional year where a lot of them were using, you know, kind of old-fashioned resources, and now what they're actually starting to do is, is take some of those resources and digitize them. So this is kind of one of those ones where this is a little more of like a traditional classroom, where what they're using is they're, they're pulling things out of that beyond textbooks and other places. A lot of times they're attaching PDFs and other documents for students to use, and they're just giving them places to drop off. Um, what we're starting to see, though, and this is the exciting part, is that we're spending the time to actually train our teachers on things like the lesson modules, which create interactivity. Um, we're starting to teach them actually how to use some of the development tools that are out there, like Captivate and some other types of things, to start pulling more and more content in here. And then, um, obviously, as, as all of us are, we're starting to use more and more um, with the Google Docs so that people can quickly and easily you know, share those pieces with their, their students. Um, you know, I don't, as far as what the whole strategic plan on this is, um, the next step that we've realized um, is we're trying to move forward with this um, is that a lot of the open source resource or open source um, educational resources are sort of a great um, starting tool um, in the sense of that's like the place where. Um, we can go to start kind of coming up with an underlying foundation for what we're doing. Like we're taking the CK um, Flexbooks and we're starting to look at how we can actually have our teachers go back and, and customize pieces of that um, coursework. In some cases, they're going in and they're looking at some of the activities and the, the um, quizzes and other things and sort of building those into their Moodle modules. Um, and then the other really exciting thing, because this is really why we wanted to move one-to-one -one and do all these things in the first place, is that now that we've kind of crossed that threshold of teachers just being used to actually having students with a device all the time, um, we're starting to see more things like collaborative work going on. So um, whereas even like a month ago, um, somebody would have integrated in something like a, a Google Doc or something like that, we're seeing lots of people use that as part of their Moodle course, where instead of doing a forum, which is pretty static and, um, you know, in place and time, you know, you got to submit your post and you got to wait for mails to post, we're seeing a teacher post up four links to um, a Google Doc and having their students and stuff work inside their class. Um, so I, that's kind of the, the, the gist of where we came from. I don't, these, these kind of things are always hard. I, I, 
what kind of questions do you guys have about what we did or are doing? <laughs> So I guess one of the questions I have is, how much professional development did you do prior to putting the Chromebooks in the kids' hands or going to one-to-one, -to -one, like starting the implementation? Okay, so as far as the curriculum piece goes, we've been, as a district, we've been doing one-to-one -one for almost four years at our high school level. Um, so we actually didn't do that much specific professional development on the Chromebooks. Um, to be honest, the people that needed more professional development than anybody was our IT staff because they were kind of more used to that traditional management environment, whether it was Mac or um, PC. So um, getting those parts of the process dialed in as far as how to manage the Chromebooks using the administrator tool and then how to manage students with inside um, Google Apps and an enterprise level, you know, when you get up to a couple thousand students, right. those were probably the bigger things. Um, for teachers themselves, um, obviously our, our biggest two focuses at that school are Google Apps and Moodle. Um, and so we actually had three different tiers for each one of those areas. So we kind of have like a, a basic level and intermediate level. And then really with our advanced levels, those almost become like practicals where if you kind of fall into that advanced group, it's more you're just meeting with other peers discussing kind of like what features you found interesting lately or hey I did this really neat thing with my class the other day have you guys seen that and as much as possible we try to break that into um, sort of departmental views because we find that you know what a science teacher may get out of it is totally different than what a language arts teacher may get out of it so that's kind of been the most of the preparation thanks mm -hmm. awesome thanks Andy that was extremely helpful does anyone else on the panel have a quick question or comment for Andy before we move on to video? I have a quick question. Um, we're finding with our Chromebooks that they're not as durable as what we were hoping they would be. And so we have students who have Chromebooks that have, um, have broken screens um, or damage in some sort that requires them to not be able to have them in their hands for a duration while they get, while they get fixed. In your district, do you supply the students with a, what I would term as a loaner Chromebook um, so they can continue to access the curriculum that's being presented electronically? Or do your students um, then, are they re um, provided paper pencil activities in lieu of the electronic? Yeah, that's a great question. We always, we learned this from our early one-to-one -one implementations. We keep about, uh, I mean, a 10% a surplus of loaner machines. Um, for that exact purpose. Um, even with, you know, more expensive laptops, you still have breakage concerns. Uh, we kind of do two things. One, um, with our insurance, the way we self-insure for ourselves, we kind of have some incentives for kids not to break their machines. Um, and we have some fees that are attached every time they need a repair. Um, we do as much of that in-house as possible, which has been real helpful. But what we found is if you don't, if you're not prepared to keep those students moving forward, and to be honest, it's one of the mean draws for us with Chromebooks is that, I mean, a kid could take their Chromebook, huck it out of the bus, and when they get to school, you could hand them a new computer and all their work is still there. Um, we, like, that's too much of a disruption for the teacher, because once your teachers get used to doing all this stuff online, to have them go back and provide a paper pencil assignment is almost, um, I mean, it's like pulling teeth, like, they're so frustrated because they put all their effort into doing this digital curriculum. So you definitely have, a, have to have a contingency and policy for that. We also have some just old Linux workstations for those kids that really are problematic. So it's like um, <laughs> if you break more than a couple of them, you may find yourself sitting in front of an old Linux machine with nothing but a, you know, a browser and your ability to get into what you need to. So that's sort of plan C. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, we're going we're gonna to jump to Vidya real quick here because I know she's got a lot of important things to talk about. And uh, um, I'm just going to turn it right over to her. She is the product manager for our Chrome OS and education um, uh, department and is responsible for all the wonderful apps and partnerships uh, with third-party developers out there. Vidya? Oh, Vidya, I think you're on mute. Okay. 
Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thanks again. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Vidya Nagarajan, and uh, I'm a product manager on the Chrome OS for um, education and business team. And um, I'm really glad to be here today to talk to you more about our applications, our app packs for education, as well as uh, some of the private store and other functionality that we have uh, built in through the Chromebook Management Console. Um, so I have a little presentation here, so maybe I'll walk you through the presentation and then we can um, talk a little bit more about anything else that you have. <coughs> Okay. Oops. Great. You guys see my whole screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I lost the presentation. Topics that I'd like to cover in this quick presentation are: I want to talk about the Chrome Web Store uh, application pack. Talk about the that we launched uh, uh, two quarters ago called the Private App Collection, and, um, and probably show you screenshots of how the different functionality in the Management Console can be used. So first, the Chrome Web Store. So the Chrome Web Store is really flourishing. So we have tens of thousands of web apps and counting. More and more HTML5 type of applications are being added by providers daily. So just recently, we had OER Commons, CK12, um, we had Agelix Buzz, as well as um, Hapara Teacher Dashboard applications that were added as of in the last couple of weeks. Um, there is an uh, education category in there, which has several subcategories. And um, as you can see in the screenshot, and uh, we have a lot of powerful web applications that get listed in here. And all of these web applications can be forces installed and pushed down onto your student Chromebooks through the Management Console. So we have um, the instituted a set of popular education application packs, and we launched that um, in the summer. Uh, these are some of our popular apps in the Chrome Web Store. And we got a lot of these applications by reviewing a number of signals. Um, some of the signals and factors that were considered was feedback and review from users in the, uh, in the Chrome Web Store, feedback from current Chromebook schools, as well as feedback from a lot of Google certified teachers. We also had a lot of surveys to get feedback from the field on the type of web applications that are being used in the classroom. And we use a lot of those signals to kind of create a curated bundle of applications. And these were organized and structured by grade level um, as well as subjects. So we had a pack of applications for the elementary school, which we call as KT5, for middle school, six to eight, and for the high school. And um, the, the, the interesting thing about all these apps in the app pack are each of these applications provide a very neat Google experience. So all of them are integrated with either OpenID or OAuth. Um, they provide a single sign-on experience. Many of these applications are also integrated with Google Drive, thus ensuring that users or students who log in with your Google accounts into the Chromebook can use the same accounts to directly log in to the third-party app. So therefore, it kind of makes the entire friction go away and actually increases stickiness. Um, so here is just a sampling of applications that we have uh, for each of the packs. And for a complete list, I'll take you to the next slide. So uh, the other interesting thing is all these, many of these applications are um, have some form of bulk purchase in them. Um, so the app packs come with free apps premium apps and paid apps. 
And for the applications which are premium or paid, we actually have a volume purchase program where through the management console, you could be taken to a volume purchase site. And in the volume purchase site, all these providers offer bulk discounts um, for purchasing 20 licenses or more. Uh, we also have a promotion going on right now uh, for, for new Chromebook schools who are purchasing Chromebooks where they also get a gift card from Google that can be used towards the purchase of these apps. So we highly recommend Chromebook schools to take advantage of this offer and to try out some of these great apps. So for a full listing of all the applications that are available out there, you can actually visit this URL and it gives you a complete listing of the apps available uh, for each of the um, different grade levels. The next feature I'd like to talk to you about is the private app collection. So we got a lot of feedback from current Chromebook schools that they like that they liked a way in which they could curate existing apps that are found in the public Chrome Web Store to make that available as well as discoverable by students in their school. So we created a feature we thought which would be called as a private app collection, which is unique to every school's domain. So for instance, this is a domain called, um, for a school who has a domain called ankitara.org. And this is a private collection for that particular school's domain. So the admin for the school could actually go and select applications in the education category or any of the other categories in the Chrome Web Store and make that available in this collection in here. In addition to that, they could also host private apps which have been created by developers or by students within the domain. And these private apps could also be made available in this private collection. This page then becomes the default landing page for any student or user who tries to access the Chrome Web Store on the Chromebook. So for example, in the screenshot here, you could see that this particular app called Physics Experiments is a private app because it has a, a padlock here which shows it's a private app. This private app was created within the school and is available only for users um, in Ankitara, the school's domain. And you have Typing Club here is a public app. This was an app in the app pack available in the public Chrome Web Store and that was selected by the admin recommended for the users here. So you actually have a nice selection of public apps and private apps that have been curated and made available in this landing page uh, for the domain. NVIDIA, that can all be done right through the Management Console? Yes, all of this is available through the Management Console. So in the next couple of slides, I'll actually take you through some screenshots which actually show you how you could kind of go through the entire flow. So I want to take you through specific features in the management console where you can do a lot of application management today. So this is a screenshot of the Chromebook management console. You have the Chrome OS service in here and you might be familiar with a bunch of these different tabs that you have today. There is a tab called applications in there and for this particular school's domain there are three different organization units. So there is an elementary school unit, a high school unit, and a middle school unit and the idea is that the needs for these different users belonging to these different OUs are different and therefore you could personalize the experience by controlling the type of applications you want to see at these different OU levels and make them unique. So here I have the apps and extensions selection. I can actually go and force install the type of apps and extensions I want to allow for the organization. So if I were to now collect, select the type of apps I want to go and install, this would take me to a dialog box. I have a bunch of options in here. I could actually select or click any of the items in the, uh, in these, uh, in, in the app packs, which is elementary, middle, or high school. Or I can directly go to the Chrome Web Store and select any of the apps I want in there and then force install it for all the users in my different organization units. So as an example, I selected the middle school category of the app pack 
and that takes me to all the applications that are available in that bundle. I can select Add All Free Apps, and then all the free apps automatically get added to the next screen. And if I were to hit Save, it then gets pushed out onto every student's desktop. So this screenshot takes me to the bulk purchase screen if I wanted to purchase a few of the paid apps. Vidya, can I ask a question really quick? Sure. This is Molly. If you go back one slide. Yes. Um, can you just clarify if when you're adding those apps um, in this way in the Chrome Web Apps and Extensions, are those automatically on their devices or do those just get added to the area that you are allowing students to go in the Chrome Web Store? So like if they go to the Chrome Web Store, are they going to just see those ones? Or when you install app, pre-install apps like that, do they go actually on the device? Good question. So when I use the force, the pre-install apps and extension, it actually goes and forces or pushes out the app onto every student's device. Thank you. So this will actually take you to the screen here, which basically, this is the student's desktop view. So you'd actually see those apps, which were selected by the administrator in the previous view, and the apps have now been pushed onto the student's desktop. So now these apps are now available so if I, as a student, was to click on any of these apps, like say if I, was, if I were to click on the video, the video has Google Apps integration done with it, I could directly be taken to the video with my Google account, and uh, I would be logged into the app, and I can then create neat, um, neat videos and podcasts. And video, that's a really good spot. We have about 20 minutes left, and it, this is a question we're getting from a lot of schools. This is Stephen on the Chromebooks team. And maybe actually, Molly, I could have you jump in and then some of the other people on the panel. What are some of the top Chrome web apps that you guys have been seeing used in the different primary, middle school, high school levels? And how else are you using the Chromebooks? I think this is a question a lot of people have. So, Molly, could we actually kick off with you? And what are the best apps you've been seeing used at those different levels? Um, and what else are you using on the Chromebooks? Yeah, um, maybe I will just share my screen really quick and show um, just some of the apps that I have on mine. Um, and these are just some that, that students are um, starting to go with. So one of my new favorites that we have is the, um, is the ability to have like Google Docs, Google Hangouts, and then you can also have the um, Sheets, Slides, and Forms. And this is such a great productivity one because the kids just, they skip going to Google Drive. Um, and once you click on Google Forms, it automatically creates a new Google Form for you. So that one has been really fun. Um, another one that the kids love um, is, and the teachers love, um, is PicMonkey. So it it's allows you to do a lot of video editing, or um, photo editing, excuse me. Um, and when we think about, um, you know, our extensions and our apps, um, we also love the PicMonkey extension because the extension allows, um, you know, the students to edit whatever pictures are on the screen. Um, it's a really easy way of sort of managing pictures to get them into an editing place and save them. Um, by using the PicMonkey extension. We also love the graphing calculator. Um, strangely enough, we love the timer, but it's a timer that's built right into, um, you know, right into your browser, and so that one's really fantastic as well. Um, let's see, what other, some of the ones that, that the kids love. A lot of the extensions are ones that we love, so, um, you know, we love awesome screenshot and screen capture. We also love um, Clearly, which is if you're reading a New York Times article or something on the web, you can wipe off all the like advertisements and stuff. And then some of the fun ones of like Chrome Speak um, um, is are some good accessibility ones too. So if you have Dictionary extension or Chrome Speak extension, you can. Um, it really makes the web just kind of a clickable interaction, and so you can double click on any word. Um, that you want and you can get the definition. So if I just click on, um, you know, one of these words here, Patriot, then I can get the definition coming up and it will actually speak uh, the word as well. And then also another um, accessibility one is if you highlight the text and you right click, if you have um, Chrome Speak installed, then you can have it read the selected text for you. So um, those are some of the ones that we found. and. Um, we just have a gazillion uses of um, how we're using Chromebooks in the classroom, and this is Chrome um, and Chromebooks in their classroom. So a lot of just, you know, a lot of the Web 2.0 tools, a ton of Google Apps, um, 
and you know sharing presentations and docs and it just makes us mobile which is really nice um, I do have another um, website just called classroom in the cloud and these are the actual examples of student work that, that they're doing so if you click on digital storytelling this is work from all of the students um, you know in my school of a lot of the work they've been able to do using the Chromebooks and they just absolutely love them I've met with so many of my teachers in the last um, kind of week and a half of a lot of my teachers that have gotten Chromebooks and the thing that I just hear from every day is the kids love them they just work and it's totally transformed the way that I'm able to do the work in my classroom because of the efficiencies and um, you know the mobile feature of just being able to work in a group and take your device with you and so we use them for um, you know creating video in the classroom um, we do use them for our Moodle environment as well and um, you know primarily for just getting our work done using Google Apps for Education. Thank you Molly this, this is awesome is that doc something you could share with the, the group I think there's a lot of useful information on there that people would appreciate. Yeah actually the um, let me just get you there's one kind of the the one site on the Chromebook classroom here is the um, is my screen still shared yes okay you could also just post that on the Google Plus feed too yep I'll just post that on the Google Plus feed so that's just excellent a little. thank you I think, I think if you Google Chromebook classroom um, you'll probably it, it probably wouldn't be too far behind um, so perfect perfect and you know this is a really interesting topic that we have a lot of conversations about um, is there anyone else out there, uh, Chen or Andy, Mary, um, you know, maybe you could share the experiences that you're seeing in the classroom and, and what type of apps are being utilized because, you know, everyone kind of has their favorites and their niches that they're, they're leaning on. So, so in, in, in Marshall, in Marshall we're in our first year of one-to-one -one implementation okay. and so we're just beginning to explore all of the different um, apps and learning how to use Google Sites and forms and documents in the classroom and how to put those together into something that supports learning across um, all of the tools. Uh, some of the teachers are really trying on the flipped classroom idea and trying to send out some little background knowledge building videos prior to the classroom time so that kids come in with some background knowledge. Um, I think Diff it's almost, I, I feel like it's really created an experimental um, environment and culture in our district because people are trying things on and we're getting together and collaborating and sharing as professionals and everyone's learning from each other and so that's the part that's really exciting I think is prior to this it felt like teachers showed up at work, went into their classrooms, closed the doors, left at 3.30 and never had much time to share and because this is all new and exciting people are intentionally getting together to do a lot of sharing and learning from one another and I think that's part of what it's been a real culture shift in our secondary schools as we've moved to one-to-one. -to -one. Great, that's, that's really great to hear. I'm, I'm wondering, hey, Chin, would you mind sharing some of the things that you're doing with your blended learning model and some of the applications yeah. that you're using? Sure, no problem. I'll, I'll have Janine, Janine uh, speak to that. Oh. Oh. Hold on, I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> So some of the things that we're doing in Milpitas, we have um, two blended learning uh, models that are going on at two of our sites, and they're both at elementary sites. Um, and what we have is a learning lab, so the kids are rotating from classroom, um, and then a portion of those kids will leave and go to the learning lab. And then while they're in the learning lab, um, we're using um, applications uh, such as ST Math from Mind Research Institute and Compass Learning. Um, as well as a lot of the Chrome apps that we're starting to use, um, such as Typing Club at the elementary level, ScoopPad, EdCanvas, Glogster, um, and then all the way up through the high school, we have a, a separate pilot going on, and it's a one-to-one -one with our Digital Business Academy. Um, and so it's incorporating tools such as the online, the graphing calculator and Desmos, and um, we've got some other apps that they're starting to use there. Um, and then we're getting ready, crossing our fingers, to push out Hapara to help manage all of um, the Google Apps that we have in place. Um, we started with Google Apps for Ed last April, um, so our teachers are getting comfortable with Google Docs and Sites, um, so now it's going to be the, the management structure that we put in place for them. Um, so that's some of what we have going on. Excellent. Anyone else want to add to that? Hi, this is 
Vidya. Yeah, it's uh, it's really great to hear all these stories because the nice thing to know is many of the apps that have been discussed are a part of the app pack. For example, I heard a lot of Glockster's, I heard about Hapara, heard about Dogo News. A lot of them are a part of the app pack. And so, you know, we'd love to continue to hear feedback from schools on what are your favorite apps so that we can actually work, Google can work with the providers and get the right apps um, in the hands of schools. So thank you for that. Thanks, Vidya. Andy, question question for you. Um, printing doesn't come up as a topic that often anymore, but I'm curious, with all of your resources moving online, are, do you guys deal with printing still, or do you have any solutions or advice for other schools out there? Yeah, well, I, I, I responded to that one comment um, on the Google Plus page. You know, as much as we're trying to get away from printing, you will just always have a few folks that, that struggle with that. and. While we've seen um, our printing go way down, um, you still need to just have that avenue for somebody to print something out. So for us, I mean, we're just using, um, we've basically created just a, a print group that we add our students to, and we've got that particular group set up um, for the cloud printing. And um, at the sites that are using the Chromebooks, we're already using um, a product called Papercut. It's just a a great little group out of, I think it was New Zealand or Australia. We've been using them for about five years now, and it's just a print server that's relatively inexpensive. Um, you can actually use it in two ways. You can either um, convert whatever you have to PDF and then drop the PDF right into Papercut and print it from there. Or since we have the print server set up, um, we just have that machine have Chrome on it as well and have set it up for iCloud or for cloud printing. And, uh, I mean, that's working well at a school with, you know, 600 kids in it. Um, not all of them are on Chromebooks. We're actually, and this will make you laugh a little bit, we're making our, our kids who um, chose to bring their own devices or, or purchase their own devices because we've got a process they can um, lease a MacBook kind of thing, sort of lease to own. And we're actually forcing those kids to go through the Google print just because it's easier for that IT staff to manage all of it in one place. Um, and so we have kids that'll develop something in like pages and then they get told by their teacher they gotta like convert that, throw it up on Google Docs and then print. And that's actually getting everybody going now. Because uh, we're also using, somebody mentioned Hapara, um, we're kind of piloting that as well and, and all those shared folders and stuff. The teachers that have embraced it um, are just, you know, adamant about kids turning all their stuff in that way. In those classrooms we see even less printing out of. So uh, it's been pretty successful. That's great. Thanks for commenting on that, Andy. Um, the next one, maybe I'll kick it back over to Molly because you talked about a lot of really cool stuff that can be done in the classroom with the cloud and with web applications and Chromebooks. The question we get a lot is just getting teachers over the hump of being comfortable with bringing in these types of web applications and bringing in Chromebooks. So I'm wondering if um, without going into, you know, it's for the sake of time, too much detail, because I'm sure we could have on a whole other hangout on this, but just what are some best practice tips for uh, professional development and getting teachers, um, you know, comfortable using Chromebooks and, and some of these uh, web applications? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, I love we're... that in some of my meetings with the teachers, um, there's just sort of a, a, a more so people are feeling more comfortable with not having to know everything and having the kids teach them a little bit. And so that's one of the, just a best practice of just the ways that we treat our teachers and saying that, you know, it's okay that you don't know everything. But um, we've been Google Apps for Education for a bit before we had Chromebooks. So most of my teachers knew about, about Google Apps. They also knew how to log in and um, sort of start a little bit of the paperless classroom of getting kids to turn things in by sharing. Um, I also just love um, having teachers visit other teachers and so we have a couple teachers that are really excited about the ways that they're using them and if another teacher sees something that somebody else is doing then um, they're much more um, apt to try it versus me who says that oh you could do this it's really easy but to me it may seem easy for them but um, you know so I just try to do the con contagious route and um, we've we've tried to be really consistent with once a month kind of interacting with the teachers around the Chromebooks and that allows you to just you know say okay we're gonna introduce the Chromebooks now next we're gonna learn a lot more about how to turn in paper um, paperless you know digitally this month we're actually gonna meet face-to-face -face and just have a little jigsaw around web apps and extensions 
and we're going to create an activity that the kids are going to do the same thing, that they're going to research an extension, talk about how they could use it, so that there's some ownership around that and that it's not all about these are the ones you use and why and how, but the web store is a place that you can explore and everybody finds different productivity apps and extensions in there and uses them differently. So that's a little bit of what we've done um, in Edina schools. Great. Yeah, I think, Andy, this would be a great one for you to comment on as well because I think one thing we get from schools a lot is that they're kind of more comfortable with commercial textbooks because a lot of the curriculum is kind of pre-planned and on and kind of cookie cutter versus when they're moving to uh, web-based, all web-based resources and OERs, there's kind of more challenge in providing lesson plans and, and the curriculum planning that still meets uh, goals. So I wonder if you have any tips or comments on that. I know that you shared a site earlier, but um, that'd be interesting for you guys to, to talk about. Yeah, that's always a, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's really funny how as we switched to a digital curriculum, we actually went through a whole curriculum alignment process in our, our district. I mean, we'd been doing it for several years before we started going digital in a massive way. Um, but because we had such clear-cut instructional and curricular expectations, I mean, we have curriculum maps and we have some of those other things, um, it's made it really easy for people to, to just find the resources that work best for the teacher and that teacher's style of teaching. Um, so you've got this real common expectation. And I think that's what typically falls apart. You know, ironically, a lot of people see a curriculum map, and what I mean by that is literally out, you know, targeted objectives and calendared objectives, and they get kind of freaked out by that. But that same exact teacher has been teaching from a textbook from the last 10 years, following the chapters in lockstep, like one after another. And you just kind of have to roll your eyes a little bit um, because there's, you know, it's actually way more freedom um, in, a, in a digital space. So um, I think, you know, the key there is, is collaboration. Um, when we went through that curriculum process as a district, we had people from all of our sites represented as they made those decisions on what was going to be our focuses. Um, and then common assessments help keep everybody together. Uh, um, like I said, now, one of the things that we get really excited about, though, too, and is where we see the major innovation coming from is our own blended learning efforts as well. You know, we've got that blended pilot where we're kind of doing the opposite. We're taking some of that mapping and stuff that we've done, putting that into a blended environment so that kids are able to you know, accelerate through that at their own pace, and then there's a lot of, you know, additional block times so that you kind of get done with that traditional instruction first at a student's own pace, and you're reinforcing it with problem based learning and exploratory learning. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of the main thing. But. Great. Jen, sorry to pass you over. Did you, you and uh, Janine want to comment on just kind of some of the things you're doing with regard to you know, PD for teachers and getting them on board with this, kind of some of the new models that you're implementing? Sure. Um, <laughs> That's why Janine's in here. One of the things that we're doing right now is um, planning on having uh, separate tracks for teachers um, because we do want to build the capacity of our, of our instructional leaders and our teachers that we do have that are ready to move forward and um, kind of be aggressive with um, their approach to, you know, just changing how they're teaching and, and learning in the classroom. So one of the things that we're doing is putting together um, what we call, I think what we're calling M21 cohort. So it's going to be a team of hopefully about 20 teachers, 20 to 30 teachers um, that really take on a year to two year uh, commitment of putting together, going through some PD themselves, um, blended learning and what those models look like. Um, and then putting together a project that they'll implement with their classroom over next school year. And then as they're doing that, we're going to be documenting, meeting with them, um, and then at the end coming together and having them somehow showcase their project for other teachers as well as um, for the students who went through the learning process to, to um, document and showcase as well for teachers and hoping to come together in like a spring conference where they can share out um, but all of that would then become examples for our other teachers that are ready to move forward. And then they, in turn, would become the mentors or the coaches for the, for the next cohort. Um, we just feel like there's so much that we're not going to be able to get to as a small PD team um, in tech services. So being able to build the capacity of the teachers themselves would be um, a good route to, to reach the masses. And so the draw and the catch would be um would be that we would hand them a, a 550 Chromebook um, and and the fact that we can 
have that extensibility in the classroom and perhaps have um, three to five um, in, the, in the experimental classrooms to begin with. And the idea is to have near one-to-one -one coverage in all of our schools, which is about 10,000 um, overall. Excellent. Thank you guys. I, I, think, I think we probably only have time for another question or two. And um, one that's been asked online is, um, if any of you can comment on best practices of how to smoothly transition from legacy applications like Microsoft Office um, so teachers don't have, uh, you know, too, there's not too much pushback right way. Is there, is there any right way that you've found that works to easily do this to well, transition to the web? Yeah, speaking from our experience, because this is, we started the, the Google Train 2 before, the, the productivity stuff, I think, is the easy thing, right? Because you can just show them how, especially with Drive now, it's literally like drag and drop your stuff into Drive, and 95% uh, of the time you're pretty much good to go. Um, what we're finding is really doing your homework ahead of time of what some of those one-off applications are in the sense of, you know, typically Shockwave or JavaScript um, that may or may not run, and that's where we're spending our energy is um, you know, just with lifecycle management on a couple of items, we've actually had to say, I'm sorry, this product's going to be around for another year, and, and then we need to find an alternative, and we're working hard to find the alternatives. Um, but it's just knowing ahead of time what those are so that, you know, is it something that some of your superstar teachers are going to, it's a hill they want to die on, or is it something that, you know, a couple of teachers way off in a far corner have used it for the last 10 years, and that's all they know. But with a little retraining, they'd actually be super stoked to see what's new. Excellent. Thanks, Andy. Hey, another question that comes up a lot and, and just showed up on, on the Google Plus page is, has anyone found a good solution for screencasting or um, any sort of substitution that you're, you're all using um, on the web? And is that a Chrome need? Book? Yeah, and is that, a, is that an important need that um, we might be lacking? I think, you know, we haven't really found one um, except for, you know, doing Google Plus recording on air kind of like this. You know, we've done a couple that um, people could do that, but we haven't found a great solution um, for that. And some of the teachers are interested in looking for a solution for that. It's something that they would even like their kids to be able to screencast, and so if it's just a student device, to have that capability would be great. Great. Before we wrap up, or uh, any other questions from anyone live on the thread? Um, we're on the Hangout, so now we're approaching time, but I think there have been some really cool best practices shared um, from Val, and, and Molly, it's great to hear you guys are using the Chrome Web Apps, and Mel Peets is cool to hear about blended learning. All this different best practice sharing is exactly what we're hoping to attain with these Hangouts, so we really appreciate all of you attending in real time, and everyone watching and commenting on the thread. Um, and presenters on here and participants, if you want to look on the thread, there might be questions that you might uh, have some good best practices to share as well, so I'm sure people would welcome your thoughts. Any last going once, going twice? <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for hosting. All right. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll have some announcements coming up in the new year. Until then, happy holidays. Yep. You Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.